many people in politics and the media, et cetera, have talked about uh, the decline of America, uh, of our uh, ability to compete uh, with the rest of the world, particularly uh, lamenting uh, our, our younger generations. Uh, and um, they seem to point the, the finger um, at our education system, uh, that blaming that, uh, that our education system is broken. But you disagree with this I ladder. Disagree. I very, I, Why? I, I very strongly disagree because our education system hasn't changed all that much and for hundreds of years, literally since this country began, we led the world in terms of our rate of economic growth. And we led the world, I think, primarily because of two things. We had public education, and the average American, even 200 years ago when most of the world didn't have public education, mm -hmm. was getting an education. Right. And secondly, we were a society that lived and breathed innovation. I don't think it's a coincidence that some of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, was primarily an inventor. Mm -hmm. Bifocals, electricity, he was an inventor. And people like Thomas Jefferson were very technical. Mm -hmm. And George Washington was a surveyor. And the country was built around the idea that we need to innovate. You know, Europe had been around for a long time. They had the big institutions, the big universities. They had resources. They had infrastructure. Here was this fledgling little set of colonies that had just come through a devastating war. And there they are with no currency. And, and, and yet, look what this country did over a couple of hundred years. Because they had, they, they, they started out as this group of defiant people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a coincidence from the beginning. Inventors like Benjamin Franklin himself, and you know Eli Whitney, and and you know why is it that it was this country that brought us the telegraph, and then you know Morse, and then Bell with the telephone, and. You know, and, and Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a coincidence that this little country, in generation after generation, kept coming up with a great new thing mm -hmm. that created the high standard of living and it created the industries and the jobs. It's not a coincidence. It was the culture of the country. Yeah. And it was, of course, supported by an education system. But once we became rich, rich country. Mm -hmm. We also created other new inventions. Leisure time. We created, you know, the national pastime of baseball. And mm -hmm. Now we have, you know, the Super Bowl is not a pastime. It's an obsession. Now we have a culture in which the role models are literally the rock stars. Mm -hmm. The role models come from two places, the world of sports and the world of entertainment. Well, those are the result of our wealth, not the cause of it. And kids are now growing up in a, in a country which sees the enormous uh, lure of, of people from the world of entertainment and sports. And these kids can be easily confused by the difference between a pastime and, and, and what their career aspirations ought to be. They can be confused that these things are fun amusements, but not what's going to build their career. It's not what's going to sustain the country. Mm -hmm. The quality of life, the standard of living, our security, the fact that our water is drinkable and that the lights turn on, mm -hmm. is not a function of the NBA, the NFL, or Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our high standard of living and our quality of life has always been a result of the work ethic, of the innovators, of the willingness of people to take reasonable risks to raise the bar. Now we have a country where, again, every kid in this country by the time they're six, seven, eight years old, particularly minorities mm -hmm. and women, see all of their role models, all of the people they aspire to be, coming from Hollywood or the NBA, and in a free culture where you get what you celebrate. If we have a generation of people, due to technology, ironically, due to media, mm -hmm. that have instant 24-hour day access but mostly what they have on that access is sports and entertainment. Precisely. It's hard to blame the education system for not having the time and attention and passion of these kids. It was never the job of education to supply the passion. They were there to fulfill the need. 
the, the gym teacher is not the person that makes the kid want to stay after school and work out for three hours, work out all summer and try out for that. The gym teacher is there to teach them how to play basketball or football. The kids, the culture, mm -hmm. creates the passion. If kids were as passionate today about being on a varsity algebra team as playing football mm -hmm. or bounce, 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 throw, we wouldn't call education a crisis. But expecting the teacher, expecting the math teacher to be the source of, of inspiration in a culture that we've got is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So I assumed we don't have an education problem, we have a culture problem. We don't have a supply problem, we have a demand problem or a lack of demand problem. We have kids even in the poorest schools with the least money in the inner cities that are still becoming great football players and they didn't get to play on sidelines. We have kids from those cities becoming great basketball players and they didn't have parquet floors. They played in the street, they played with barbed wire hoops. But what they have is passion for something that they want to celebrate. I believe that if our culture can redirect kids to have them understand that science, engineering, inventing, problem solving, is every bit as accessible, every bit as rewarding, every bit as much fun as bouncing a ball. And unlike bouncing a ball, it doesn't create a few dozen jobs every year. It creates millions of jobs every year. If, if the kids in this country could have the same passion for learning and problem solving and inventing as we've taught them, to have for these other things, I think America would once again be at the top of the global list of, of innovators. If we don't do that, there's no reason to believe that this country deserves to have its high standard of living or its high quality of life. We never took those things away from other countries. We created them. And if we don't continue to create them, those other countries aren't going to give it to us. Why should they? Mm -hmm. So the answer is we either create wealth by solving problems, by innovating, or we give those things up. They are not a birthright. And politicians don't necessarily want to tell that to people. It's not a happy message. Everybody in our society is, is always looking these days for quick fixes and always yes. looking to blame somebody for something. It's because you didn't have this or because I talk to these kids and say, go home and look in the mirror you're going to look at the only person that will determine whether you'll be a success in life or not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you went to school. We all know that. You know that you can become a great football player or basketball player by working out five hours a day. It doesn't matter where you live. Well, you know what? That's true of being a scientist or an engineer. And if you don't grow up to be seven feet tall, which you can't control, if you don't grow up to be one of the four or five best ball masters, you might not have a career. But if you exercise the muscle hanging between your ears and you become pretty good with that one, there's all sorts of career options available for you. So I don't think it's an education problem. I think it's a culture problem. It's an attitude problem. Our political leaders need to convince kids. It takes a whole generation of focus to get smart. I don't have a quick fix for you. This wasn't a quick problem. It developed over a generation as we lost our edge, as we lost our focus, as we lost our work ethic. And we need to bring it all back if we want to have a high standard of living and a high quality of life and security. We need a whole generation of kids to embrace the hard work and the reasonable risks associated with trying to do new things better. Mm -hmm. And nobody should tell these kids it's easy, or you can get there quickly, or you can do it without risk and without frustration, without failure, because mm -hmm. that isn't so. Uh, but I believe that if you can put kids in an environment where they can see that science and technology and engineering and math is powerful and it is relevant and it is for everybody, including girls and minorities, you'll change their attitude. So we started our, you know, I said, look, kids love sports and entertainment. Let's turn science and engineering into sports and entertainment. Let's create a double elimination tournament at the end of a six or eight week season, a short intense season like football and basketball, that ends in the same way they do, not with a test and a judgmental in classroom. No, let's let a season end with a celebration, with a with a tournament. Let it end with cheerleaders and school bands and, and kids getting 
recognition and trophies and awards for trying to build great solutions to problems. And in the process, they learned math and they learned engineering and they learned technology. And, and they have fun doing it. And they, and they have enormous fun. We have a culture that says if it's not fun, don't do it. And you can't compete with that. So I don't want to compete with it. We, it's part of our playbook. We're going to make science and engineering fun and relevant and important. And we're going to put in front of these kids the, the superstars of the world of science and technology. And they're in all the companies that are in that room out there. That's why I came here. I need those people to join us. Uh -huh. The first year we did our competition, I had 23 companies, about 23 high schools. And that was when? And that was in 1990, 91. Okay. And now, 20 years later, instead of having one event at the end of one build season that was six weeks long, and that one event was those 23 companies from all over the country flying in to Manchester, New Hampshire to fill a high school gym. This year, we start March Madness, the first weekend in March, and every weekend in March we have nine or ten cities, little cities like New York, Detroit, Chicago, <laughs> Los Angeles, San Jose, Cleveland, Seattle, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Atlanta. We have 50 cities throughout March holding their regional events. We have 19,000 schools competing. We have 61 countries sending teams. They get a couple of weeks off, and then at the end of April, we have the 76,000 seat Edward Jones Arena under the arch in St. Louis where we hold the global championships. We have 90,000 scientists and engineers as volunteer mentors. We have a couple of thousand corporate sponsors. This year we have, this is really exciting, just to get to all the kids to prove that we are cool and that it's for everybody. Uh, at our kickoff last week, I had uh, Will I Am, as in the Black Eyed Peas, come and talk to the kids and announce that they we're gonna, he's gonna do the halftime show for the Super Bowl next week as a warm up for the show he's gonna do for us in San Luis. <laughs> so yeah. we're starting to get real momentum to become accessible to all kids. But unless the next generation of kids reemerges as a generation willing to work hard, willing to take appropriate risks, willing to raise the bar with science and technology, this country is not going to be able to maintain global leadership, economically or otherwise. It's not going to be able to give its new next generation a higher quality of life than their parents, which would be the first time that's ever happened in this country. But we can't wish it away, we can't whine it away, we can't point and blame it away. It's a real issue, and the issue is we have to change the culture of this country so that kids celebrate and work hard at achieving the right goals. Mm -hmm. And I think the technical community in this country has a huge, huge role in that because it's the technical community where all the new jobs are going to be created. Mm -hmm. It's the technical community that are going to deliver the solutions to healthcare problems, environment problems, energy problems. They need to capture the hearts and minds of kids. And the sad truth is they're so busy working on those big problems, they've left those kids as, as easy prey for the world of entertainment and sports to just capture all of their time and attention. And frankly, I love entertainment and I love sports in the appropriate balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've got to recognize that we get to play and we get to do sports and we get to enjoy entertainment.